like changes that we do over the days and each by the school of our lessons. Uh, definitely a privilege to be a part of his life, have him in our lives. Um, church has certainly been blessed in many ways by him, uh, not only in service in the deaf ministry, um, you all can see the sign, but just, you know, what he brings to the congregation, right? We know that all the pieces here are beautiful reason. He has certainly served us well. And so without any further ado, um, I give you our brother, Mike Chick. Caught me by surprise there. I uh, heard the applause. I thought like Robert Downey Jr. or Tom Cruise was standing behind me or something like that. So we are excited, the fellow brothers and I that are teaching this year, we're excited to share with you our findings from our studies about this topic of being fearless. And I think what I like to propose is instead of looking at the series as four different lessons, what we're really proposing to you and presenting to you is an evolution and a journey of an individual who finds the empowerment to become fearless through their faith and how that fearless trait evolves over one's life into how they evangelize, into the relevance of Peter's scripture and also into sacrificial service. So with that being said, it's easy whenever you hear a lesson to think about what you can apply to change someone else's life. But I want us to pivot a little bit and think about more so of in an examination of ourselves, of me and taking the mirror and pointing it inwards. So that being said, before we continue, I believe that there was a manual like this that was distributed to everybody by a raise of hands. How many of us have this manual on us today? Oh, okay, so no pressure then. Wow. I was gonna ask you if you were, if some of you were able to read the manual ahead of time, but since you didn't, not, not necessarily a big issue. So I'm gonna start with a disclaimer to everybody. When I read the content of this lesson, I thought the premise of the lesson is good, which is addressing our fears with faith, which is based on the word of God. But when it comes to the body of the lesson, I think that there was a little bit of a room for opportunity because it was very heavy on the apologies apologetic details. So that being said, I kind of changed the theme a little bit this year. So we're going to go from this theme, Luke scripture, to faith actualized. So just to give you a really quick summary of what we're going to be talking about today, this is going to be the roadmap. And if you don't mind, I'm going to move the mic a little bit closer to me so you can hear me. So we're going to talk about this idea of misinformation that I brought up a few weeks ago. And we're going to see how it's relevant to today's topic. Because essentially, we're going to learn that through misinformation, fear has spread to the human condition. And that misinformation isn't just related to politics or social media but it actually pertains to every aspect of our life and how misinformation has brought us to a descent into fear. Next, we're gonna talk about actualized faith and how our faith is the remedy to fear. And lastly, after I'm done talking for about 30 to 35 minutes, we're gonna have you share your experiences to how this lesson relates to you. So that being said, let us begin. So this, whoop, moved forward just a little bit too much. This is a picture of Viktor Orban. He is the current prime minister of Hungary. And in 2018, he ran for re-election. And he is the current political party of the Fidesz political party. When he ran for election, his party was losing popularity dramatically. And what was seen as a cynical move to garner additional votes, what he would do is he would change his re-election strategy. He would start blaming all of the... Yeah, sure. It's only something you can't see because of the sidewalk. Oh. If you guys want to move so that you can see the screen? Thank you. Please do so at this time, right? You realize that the sidewalls are blocking you. I don't know if the same thing's happening over here, so we just want to move closer to the middle and go further back. Yourself. Um, sorry about 
We could real move the real estate too. <laughs> So continuing, Victor Orban started running with a narrative. He started blaming all of the country's issues on all of the incoming immigrants. And if reelected, he vowed to protect the Hungarian heritage, protect the Hungarian way of life, even protect Hungarian women from, quote unquote, them. In an interview, Victor Orban claimed that over 10 million Africans were prevented from coming into the country, and that if anything, that there were waves of additional immigrants coming in. But when it was closely examined, it was revealed that only a fraction, and not even just that, but barely a fraction of these individuals were found coming into the borders. It was really revealed that essentially, not a lot of people were actually interested in coming into Hungary. This is a post and one of many Facebook posts from the Fidesz political party. It claims that supposedly four immigrants were caught and recorded attacking a Hungarian citizen. However, when this video was closely examined, it was actually revealed that this video was not recorded in Hungary. It was actually recorded in an incident in Brazil. And it was actually recorded three years before the post was actually put up. And it was actually revealed that this video had no correlation whatsoever with Hungary. Well, fortunately for Viktor Orban and his political career, he was reelected. However, unfortunately, public opinion, resentment, and domestic hostility increased toward all Hungarian immigrants. And to this day, they are still dealing with that backlash. And what we find in common cases where misinformation is present is that it simply doesn't alter facts but it actually reinforces humankind's divisions and stokes our deepest fears. For instance, let's take a look at some of these other examples. Misinformation portrayed the Tutsi people of Rwanda as monsters, swindlers, and, and criminals for decades. And this narrative led to a horrendous genocide in 1994 in which over 800,000 to a million Tutsi citizens were massacred by Hutu extremists. World War II, which involved the nation of Japan, created a fear of the Japanese population within the country. In other words, there was misinformation that was spread. And as a result, FDR signed Executive Order 9066, which led the whole population of Japanese people within the country, including US citizens that were of Japanese descent, to be incarcerated in internment camps from 1942 to 1945. So let's go back to the beginning of time. And let's talk about the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, we know that they were the first two individuals and they lived in a perfect utopia with God. And God told them that they can do whatever they wanted, except one thing, to eat from the tree of the Garden of the knowledge of good and evil. However, we know what Adam and Eve did. Well, let's go to the narrative. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the tree, you, will, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What we find that's very fascinating is that the very first act that was ever committed in humankind, just like Hungary, just like Rwanda, just like the United States, and just like where misinformation is ever present, the very first sin ever committed was as a result of misinformation. And when we think and when we view what misinformation is and what it does, we find these common patterns. Number one, misinformation is usually a belief or a set of beliefs, perceptions that are founded on a false narrative.
something happened. Never mind. Having some technical difficulties here. There we go. Thank you, Danny. Next, we see that misinformation and the narrative of misinformation usually stokes our deepest insecurities and fears. If we were to read between the lines of what the serpent said to Eve, essentially, it would sound something like this. God, that's what God told you, Eve. Ooh, you're getting played. You're getting the short end of the stick. And normally when we think about misinformation, we find that misinformation never advocates for reconnection or alignment. It never goes, well, you know what, Mark, he did something shady. But you know what, let me go talk to Mark. Let me find out what happened. Let me get his side of the story. Rather, misinformation is always, someone did something wrong, we gotta do something about it right now. And isn't that a common theme that we hear in today's day, whether or not it's in regards to politics or the COVID vaccinations? It's always, the Democrats, they're doing this. Or the Republicans, they're doing this and we gotta stop them. The, the COVID vaccinations, it's always something with this. It's always in an alarmist tone. But what you never find is that the two parties are advocating for mutual discussion. And usually as a result of fears being stoked and insecurities being stoked, the next happens. It results in some type of unethical or human behavior. And in the end, we realize that misinformation, it's sewn into every fabric of our society. I mean, think for a second of all the errors and mistakes and sins that you've committed. How many of them was as a result of misinformation? Meaning, how many times that perhaps you started a fight or an argument with your wife, with a friend, with your husband, because you thought they, they said something in a way that they didn't intend to say. And then later on, you basically found out that it was never meant in that context. Well, in essence, you reacted based on misinformation. And let's look at some of these other types of misinformation. Never let your guard down. How many of us are familiar with this? Usually this ideology is self-taught and conceived when our trust has been betrayed. Those who hold to this ideology are extremely vigilant and suspicious of others. In other words, they're very fearful. Usually they're extremely inquisitive. They're constantly questioning you for what you did. Well, why did you say that? Why did you have to use those words the way that you used? Or you know what? When you did that, why did you do it that way? Like you could have done it another way. And we normally find that individuals that tend to hold to this ideology, their relationships tend to be strained by unfounded reservations. And generally individuals who hold to this ideology lean toward a fight mentality when it comes to the fight versus flight spectrum. And we can clearly see that when we compare this ideology to the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13 verse seven, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love seeks to look for the good in people. It's one thing if your relationship was hurt and you did experience a betrayal of trust, but even that the Bible does advocate for a level of tact and sensitivity, but it's a completely different thing to start a relationship with someone that you've never met with that type of suspicion. Well, what about this next one? I can't say no. This fear-based behavior is linked to the belief that disapproval from others is a bad thing. And if you say no, you're going to gain their disapproval. So in order to avoid that, there seems to be an absolute allergy to saying the word no. Or if it's said, it's said in a watered-down fashion, like, you know what? I'm really, really busy, but I, I guess I could do it. Or maybe you're talking to someone who has this this belief and they're telling you, you know, I was just talking to this person, they asked me what to do and Monday I, I was telling this person I was busy and Tuesday 
I'm doing this and Wednesday I'm doing this. And oh, so in other words, you said, no. Well, not exactly because I was trying to tell this person that they weren't getting it. And Friday, I actually had an hour. So I, I, I guess I told the person, yes. Well, usually some who hold to this form of misinformation possibly may have had parents who left them feeling like they always had to conform to their parents' uh, parents' expectations or even to earn their parents' affections through conforming. Or others may have had a parent or a caretaker who suffered from some type of illness and condition and you basically learn to put the needs of others over yourselves. And how do we know that this is a form of misinformation? Well, 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 10, verse 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Meaning you could always say no, nothing's gonna stop you. God's not gonna stop you from saying or saying yes all the time. But the question is, how beneficial is it for you to always say yes? How beneficial is it for your schedule? How beneficial is it for your spiritual maturity? Things to think about. So I did preface this lesson by saying that today, the theme of this lesson is gonna be about us, ourselves. And we can say that these first two forms of belief, you know, they may not necessarily be too common in the Lord's church. So what about this one? We'll rest in heaven. Now, Mike, are you saying that we're not going to rest in heaven? No, that's, that's not what I'm saying. But this statement is usually said whenever one is burnt out from serving at a high capacity. You've maxed out your week serving brothers and sisters, doing Bible studies, evangelizing, and you're like, man, you know, tomorrow I got something else going on. I guess, you know what, we'll rest in heaven. And it's usually said within this context. And this is based on a misconception on the biblical concept of denying oneself. It holds that the application of biblical denial entails constant, keyword, keyword, constant, unyielding behavior, such as minimal sleep, unhealthy maintenance of one's health for holy endeavors at the risk of one's physical and emotional well-being. And how do we know that this belief is misinformation? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. The Bible does advocate to a certain degree of physical maintenance. So, when we think about this, does this necessarily mean that if you deny yourself of sleep occasionally, that you're unholy? No. Does it mean that if you skip a meal on occasion because you need to make time for a Bible study, that you're unholy? No. But I think, if anything, there should be a sense of reservation when it's substantial, and it should definitely be noted if it's compromising your health. So that being said, we've identified the problem, right? Misinformation has bred fear into the human condition. So how do we combat it? What do we do? Well, I can't think of no better references to acts of fearlessness than found in Hebrews chapter 11. We're not gonna read the whole entire chapter, but upon looking at Hebrews 11, you can see a collection of recorded cases of fearlessness. And I'm gonna breeze through these. Verse four, it references that Abel offers a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. In verse seven, it speaks of the trust that Noah had in God when building the ark, though an inbounding destructing flood could not be seen or foretold. In verse 27, it refers to the warrior spirit of Moses when he defied a king of Egypt and led a Hebrew exodus. And then there are many other passages referring about kingdoms would be conquered through faith, justice enforced through faith. This next one is one of my favorites. Strength forged through weakness. Sounds like the making of a great Marvel movie, right? Maybe someone should push, pitch this for, to Marvel or DC. And we see that these acts of fearlessness 
and a fearless life is possible only when faith is involved. So how does that happen? Well, some of us are familiar with some of these passages about faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. James chapter 2, verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have work. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So one passage talks about faith being the assurance and a conviction. Then the other one talks about faith being works. What is it? And what does it mean? Well, I would like to propose to you an interesting explanation that I recently heard about faith that was said in a very unique way, but I believe in a very biblical way. The phrase is, faith is about experiencing the reality of the thing that we hope for. Faith is not the rejection of thinking and reason. It just doesn't end there, but ends and results in commitment. Faith is not only a mental activity. Faith begins with thinking and reason. All of these individuals and all of these examples, and of course the person is talking about the list in Hebrews 11, all of these examples reasoned and acted upon that reason, and as a result, had an experience by something that is not of themselves. So if I was to explain this whole passage in short, essentially what it's saying is, by acting and holding to a God-given reason, and the commitment to act upon that reason, when those two factors are present, then you have an opportunity to experience faith. In other words, your faith is actualized. Well, let's kind of put that theory to the test and put it through the Berean challenge, as I would say. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, that's the reason God warned Noah. In reverent fear, constructed an ark. There's his commitment to act for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. That was his, ex his experience. Let's go to the next verse. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, and also verse 12. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. That was his reason. And he went out, that's his commitment to act, not knowing where he was going. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the source of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. That was the experience. And those of us who are in this room right now, we're still benefiting from that experience today. So that being said, let me share with you my own personal faith story. Some of you are probably wondering, what, what in the world is Mike putting up a picture of a roller coaster? I promise, it actually has some relevance to this faith story. If anything. I'm, not, I'm not showing off. Well, maybe I'm showing off just, just a little bit. So this is my unique story, which I'm sharing for the first time publicly. No one knows about this except my wife. And me. I think maybe I told the Arias at one point. But when I was baptized, as Rod referenced, I was 18. And I came with a lot of baggage. I came from a big family. Uh, my mother and her family had five sisters, one brother, and on my father's side, had five brothers and one sister. So you can imagine there were a lot of aunts and uncles, there were a lot of cousins, but our family wasn't really that keen on gatherings. So social gatherings for me were very foreign. Things like Thanksgiving dinners, Christmas dinners, milestones like graduations, birthdays, that wasn't necessarily a thing. And to add a layer of complexity to that, I was pretty much bullied all my life, all the way from elementary school going up to high school. And when Pedro shares the stories about him being bullied and being a, a nerd and being at the bottom of the totem pole, I could relate to that. And to me, that bullying was extremely substantial. I'll leave the gory details out of that. But leading up to high school, that stopped because I had learned to put on 
a specific persona, but that persona was built on fear. It wasn't built on confidence. And that combination of not necessarily being keen on social settings and having that experience of bullying, that created something inside of me. I basically had a severe social anxiety. I would be with a bunch of friends and for no reason whatsoever, it wasn't like my friends were picking on me, it was just a regular day hanging out. And all of a sudden, for reasons unknown, I would just start hyperventilating. My skin would clam up. I would just start sweating uncontrollably. And I just didn't know where, what it was coming from. And, you know, like I said, it was just a perfectly normal day. And the only way that I could resolve that was to step away and be by myself. And even sometimes by stepping away, that didn't resolve it. So that being said, now at 18, I get baptized into the Long Island Church of Christ, where everything we do is about being up close and personal. We hug. You know, we get in each other's faces and we talk about how our day went and we ask about our days and we're very intimate with that. Woo. You can only imagine that that wasn't doing very well with my social anxiety whatsoever. And then on top of that, we're called to preach the gospel, to start random conversations with people that we've never met. And that was extremely I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say extremely impossible. I would say that it seemed practically impossible with the anxiety that I was feeling at that time. And basically at that time, my peers, Rob Young being one of them and Victor Quay, all of them were growing in their faith. They were going out and they were coming back and they were sharing, hey, you know, of these men of Bible studies today, I preached to this person. Even those that were getting baptized after me, they were developing in their faith through their evangelism, through their fellowship. And here I was, barely even able to just get a word in, into a conversation. And unfortunately, as I continued this, it, it just seemed like I was trapped in this unending pattern of social anxiety. And the thing about this was this anxiety continued. It never stopped. During my quiet times, these were some of the scriptures that would inspire me. These would be my reasons. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, of course, go and therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 10, verse 39, this was actually one of my favorites. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. These were the scriptures and the reasons that convicted me. The problem is, is as much as I had a desire to change, I still didn't know how to manage this social anxiety. And then, you know, at times through perception, you know, some brothers and sisters would say, hey, you know, Mike, Mike just prefers to be a loner. You know, he just wants to be by himself, which personally hurt, but I still, had that conviction. I wanted to change. I wanted to grow out of that anxiety. So I brainstormed and I was like, you know what, what can I do? I mean, I've, I've done quiet times. I've prayed, you know, what is there left? And I brainstormed about some practical examples. And I realized that there was one thing that I did that simulated the sensations of my social anxiety. It elevated my heart rate. It made me sweat uncontrollably. And of course, that thing was going on roller coasters. See, I did tell you that this was a unique story. So, so I would go to Six Flags purposely because I actually wanted to grow accustomed to the sensation of anxiety. Basically, I'm admitting that I'd rather plummet to my death on a roller coaster than engage in a social conversation with you guys. But that was my lot at that time. And yes, I would get looks whenever a brother or sister would ask me how I spent my Saturday, and I would tell them, you know, I went to Great Adventure again, you know. But I knew why I was doing it. Oh, and by the way, I had a severe fear of heights. But for some strange reason, and I can't still explain it to this day, I was able to get on a roller coaster. All right. 
So what I would do is I would just ride roller coasters until I got used to the, the sensation of getting used to feeling anxiety. And then what I started to do eventually was I started inviting a small group of brothers and sisters. And we would fellowship while we were waiting online. And that was something that eventually I got used to. So now this awkwardness that I had about small intimate settings, now I was growing accustomed to that. And then my project evolved again, because as I got accustomed to fellowshipping, we took it to the next level. We would begin evangelizing to those who waited online in front of us and behind us. And eventually that socializing, that fellowshipping, you know, the evangelizing, it was no longer limited to just great adventure, but now I was doing it everywhere. I was able to do it at work. I was able to do it in, while I was on my commute. And funny enough, in fall of 2001, the church started thinking about planning a college ministry at Old Westbury College. And finally, after six years or so, I was finally able to be in a position to serve at a maximum capacity for the, with the brothers and sisters that were a part of that ministry. Now, am I saying that you should ride a roller coaster in order to battle your anxiety? Actually, maybe. For me, my commitment to actualize my faith came in the form of riding roller coasters. But I've heard of stories of brothers and sisters that struggled with evangelism and they would participate in mock evangelism sessions. They would get together and pretend to evangelize with each other. That was how they committed to actualizing their faith. I heard of other brothers and sisters that purposely went evangelizing with an older brother every week of the month and fellowshipping, or should I say evangelizing with a different brother. One week they would evangelize with Pedro. Another week they would evangelize with Bob. One week they would evangelize with Fred. The point being is that whatever the form of commitment that you may take to actualize your faith, one thing is clear from Hebrews chapter 11, and personally I can attest to this, which is actualized faith will take you to places in your life there are measurably more than what you can ask or imagine. Sounds kind of familiar, right? But let me ask you, without faith-based empowerment, how does one navigate life with the abundance and fulfillment that Jesus promises? Without faith-based empowerment, how can one live fearlessly and free from the slavery of fear? Without faith-based empowerment, how does one even convince another person that Christianity is worth investing in? And I'm kind of plugging Steve's lesson actually right now as I speak. Even more so, without faith-based empowerment, how can we effectively preach the gospel? How can I advocate and be an ambassador for the gospel when my personal life is still enslaved? I want to share with you a quote from one of our own. It says, of course, obedience to the gospel is imperative. Of course, our imperative is to save the lost. The gospel is the only thing that saves. But after we've shared the gospel, three, four, five, 10 times, they, referring to those who do not know Jesus, they have to see us living it. They have to see, why would I wanna be a part of this kingdom that you're a part of? And this quote is taken from our brother, Danny Aponi, in the lesson that he did for a men's fellowship. Now, Danny believes that I never pay attention to a word he says, but I do, I do, clearly. Maybe once every five years, but now I'm kidding. Danny's my close brother there. I like to josh with, around with him a lot. But that being said, to answer his question, how will they find that? By seeing you live fearlessly for the Lord. So in conclusion, misinformation stokes our deepest insecurities and fears and traps us to act unethically and inhumane. But faith empowers us to rise above our fears. So that being said, I've talked enough, but I think it's time now for you to have a little brainstorming session of your own to see how this lesson applies to you. So I'm gonna ask you now to form groups of roughly five to eight, let's just say. And in your groups, 
you can talk about how or share a fear or a false narrative that you used to live by and how did that impact your life for me i shared i struggled with the social anxiety for you maybe a false narrative caused you to struggle with anger maybe for some of you it caused you to struggle with self-control but talk about a fear and a false narrative that you used to live by and how did that impact your life and then share how did your faith address it and if you're currently going through a fear or a struggle share that and the brothers and the sisters that are in your group can brainstorm together and help you find a practical way and by the way let me throw up this challenge right now in your discussions i'm going to encourage you to be as specific as you can because i know usually the easy answer and the cliche answer is hey i read my bible i prayed and god took care of it i'm going to ask you to be even more specific and find practical ways of how you can be able to actualize your faith. So I would say the next 10 minutes, you can start your discussions now, groups of six to eight. So.